Assalamualaikum and a very uh, good evening everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening on our online series uh, number nine, I believe. So I hope everyone is uh, safe and um, strive to be productive uh, as much as possible. Um, just to remind uh, the viewers, uh, especially on, uh, on Zoom uh, viewers, we have received official approval from LAM on CPD points to all our online series. And all online series is actually open to uh, PAM members as well as non-members. Um, currently, the CPD points are only applicable for viewers on Zoom, uh, not on FB Live. So those who are now viewing on FB and require CPD points, you may want to register uh, online uh, via Zoom. Um, CPD points under LAMP require continuous participation. Uh, it's a proper, complete record of participation. So that's why the team has set up a device, uh, a system whereby uh, at the early uh, part of the session, there will be a pop-up screen that shows a sign-in code. And later in the session, there will be another code which is a sign out code. You need to remember these two codes and fill up questionnaires via link that will be provided at the end of the session. Once you uh, fill up the questionnaire and submit, that will complete your participation record for the purpose of CPD points. Um, I would like to share the vision of online series uh, under PAM. We we would like to have this online series to function almost like a broadcast uh, house or broadcast center whereby we fix Thursdays and Saturdays as our uh, broadcast time. In season one, uh, up to April, April, April and May, we managed to complete five episodes over three series. Uh, each series we have one or two episodes and these five episodes uh, have already been uploaded on PAM YouTube channel so you can uh, search this uh, title on, on YouTube. Uh, in season two which we started in June uh, ending in August we've added four more series um, and each series will contain about two, uh, two or one or two episodes um, while we continue uh, with the season one series with episode three and four. Um, for today's session, uh, it is actually our episode three uh, of the series, uh, talking about or discussing on quality of works in, on completed projects. So what we're going to focus on today is more on the roles and responsibilities in managing quality within specified deliverables or specified uh, deliveries. So uh, we are lucky uh, today that we have our uh, a, a new speaker uh, that joined the team, uh, Mr. Lau Hon Kiong, in addition to our regulars, uh, architect Anthony Lee and uh, Mr. Kristan. Uh, I will do a bit of introduction uh, later uh, on the speakers. Before I do that, I would like to recap on I would I would like to recap on the previous episodes. Okay, um, we have established that architects uh, are no longer in full control of quality of works. We are no longer gatekeepers nor the custodian of quality in buildings, and um, the quality now is perceived to be commercialized, uh, driven by market forces, and the delivery of quality is very much uh, depends on what was paid, promised and advertised. So for us architects, uh, an independent professional, uh, we maybe uh, there's a question whether we should get entangled into this uh, branding exercise of advertisements, sales and promotional materials. Um, because quality is, is very much subjective, uh, it's relative and, and, and uh, remains elusive because there is no uh, measurable benchmark standards that define what is acceptable. So as stated, at the moment, we don't have a practical quantitative, quantitative uh, benchmark that can be relied on uh, in Malaysia. So we discuss about the possibility of, of having a national standards of, uh, to benchmark 
what is acceptable quality. We discuss this, uh, but we we think that uh, having this creates uh, its own set of problems. Uh, one side fit all quality standard may not be the way forward. Um, instead, the quality must be clearly described or expressed uh, or thought of from design and expanded in uh, specifications so that construction can follow through and upon building completion, it can be tested, commissioned properly. Uh, as such, it, it is more uh, quantifiable. So the project delivery uh, shouldn't suffer premature breakdown. It should be safe, it should be fit for purpose, and it should comply with the laws and regulations. As architect, when we issue uh, CCC, effectively we are the auditor of compliance of the various standards, uh, as we, we know. Um, so um, instead of being the custodians or guaranteeing quality, we should focus on measurable quantitative role as auditor of compliance and, and completion. Uh, in other words, uh, focusing on basics and fundamentals that uh, for the building to fit for intended purposes uh, uh, above uh, the life safety uh, of the user. And another thing to, to, for us to keep reminding ourselves is that to, to be clear that there is a definitive separation between defect liability period, warranties and service of life of buildings. This note is just to remind ourselves when we signed as PSP uh, on uh, as PSP as the certifier of certificate of completion and compliance, we are very much uh, uh, signing into uh, uh, or we are legally required and expected under the law that we have designed in compliance to the approved plans and we have specified materials uh, or use uh, material that is suitable and fit for its purpose and the projects are being, uh, have been constructed and completed in good and workmanlike manner in accordance to the practice uh, acceptable. So uh, those basically uh, a bit of recap from episode one and two. Uh, as I mentioned, if you are, um, if, if you uh, want to look at the details, then you can, you can watch uh, via YouTube uh, channel. Um, Yes, under PAM YouTube channel. So for today's discussion, we would like to focus more on the objective or uh, try to uh, look at quality in an objective manner instead of subjective so that it becomes measurable, uh, quantifiable, then it, we are able to assess. And uh, looking at this, we, we, when we mention about quality being subjective, and relative and elusive, does it mean that we should pass the whole responsibilities on quality to others, um, especially when it comes to design and build contract? In fact, on this uh, subject, we discussed a bit uh, on self-regulation in previous session online series, whether the responsibilities, uh, the responsibilities uh, and liabilities on project deliveries can be actually broken to uh, various uh, various parties, various uh, professionals, instead of just relying on very limited professional bodies. And uh, if that's the case, then um, how can architects manage quality in delivery projects within the specified quality? That's the probably uh, the focus that we have put to the speakers to discuss today. Again, a reminder, um, uh, this uh, online series, uh, the CPD points only applicable to, uh, to viewers via Zoom, uh, watch out for the two codes. Okay, let's move on to the introduction of the speakers today. Um, I'll, I'll start with our new speaker first, um, Mr. Lau Hon Kiong. He is the Executive Director of Henry Butcher Malaysia, Sindiran Bahad. Um, he is a registered valuer and estate, estate agent under Board of Valuers, has extensive experience on building management, uh, managing residential, special purpose building, commercial, retail properties. And I think uh, his views today is, uh, is an added value uh, to the series. And our next speaker is the architect Anthony Lee. He is basically uh, the curator 
uh, of the content of the discussion today. Uh, he is a registered practicing architect since 95. Uh, on top of practicing, uh, being a practicing architect, he has also uh, embarked or expanded his career into other areas. He is a builder, a developer, and now currently holding a post as a director of Architect Center Sendiran Bahad, which is a subsidiary of PAM company. Uh, the main business of Architect Center is uh, building inspections, uh, doing forensic building, building inspections. Um, uh, Architect Anthony is a certified trainer. He has produced uh, quite a number of articles uh, published in newspaper. And he has also presented a few papers online and as, well, as well as uh, through various CPD programs all over the country. Our second, our third speaker, actually there's no one first, second and third, they all have equal uh, importance uh, to us. Um, but um, Mr. Kristan is very important also uh, in this series because he is a practicing lawyer. Uh, a founder and managing director of Shear Associates, uh, practice uh, since year 2000. Uh, he said that his company is a boutique legal service provider, uh, now positioning the niche from being a corporate advisor to everything real estate, uh, advisory services or possibly advice on civil litigation as well. So, uh, and the Christian's uh, views uh, we'll give a, a, a different dimension to overall uh, discussion. Okay, uh, I'll stop there now. Um, so I'll pass over to uh, Architect Anthony Lee to take over. Uh, over the console to you now, Anthony. I'll see you back later um, during moderation session. Oh yes, before Anthony starts, I forgot to remind, for those viewers, if you have any question, you can start posting your questions uh, from the Q&A button on Zoom or those who are watching on Facebook, you can still post your question, I will pick up from there. Okay, over to you Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, good afternoon to all, all our listeners. Um, thanks for signing in. Quite a, quite a, it's nice to see. You know, I went through the, the list. It's nice to see, you know, so many of the people who are involved with Architect Center is signed up as well. Um, welcome also to our listeners from Penang and Australia. I see some of our architects drumming how one of our inspectors have also signed in as well. Okay, um, I'm just going to get started here uh, with this, uh, what I had posted up uh, before in the previous slide here. I think this is basically to set the theme of the day. Uh, you know, uh, th this is basically the, the, the situation where we are today, you know. Uh, you know, why is it that the standards of our buildings have come down so low? And, and you know, this has led on to, to a series of, of these talks that we are doing this year. And also, of course, you know, the work that we are doing in Architect Center, you know, uh, which predominantly, you know, are, are addressing the issues of, of, of defects that the industries are facing with the, proper, with the building, uh, completed buildings that, that we see today, okay? So um, I'm going to introduce um, our first speaker here. Uh, he's, I've chosen him to, to, to come in uh, in the beginning. It's because um, Hong Kiong runs so many properties in town. And he's basically the person who is the heir of, you know, he's the one who inherits all of these completed buildings that we put into the market. As I've said, as architects and contractors, we probably spend three to five years uh, designing and constructing the project. But Hong Kiong has to take uh, the possession of these properties on behalf of his clients, which are the buyers of the properties uh, and, and, and owners of the property for the life cycle of the building. So, you know, anything up to 50 years. Some, most of the projects he receives are new, but some of them are also the, the older ones that, that he goes in. So he has a wealth of, of uh, exposure uh, in, in, in the kind of um, concerns that he has faced whether it's a new building or whether it's an older building. So I think this is really a, a, a very good um, yardstick for us to hear from him. Uh, because, you know, most of us, once we finish the project, we walk away and then we go on to the next project. So I think it's, it's, it, it, it'll be nice to, to be able to welcome um, um, Hong Kiong. So with that, Hong Kiong, can I welcome you to uh, the jump in? Uh, very good evening to uh, Anthony and panel of uh, discussion for today's. 
uh, BAM session. In fact, it's, uh, I feel very honored to be invited to share my little feedback or not to say experience from various parties, especially from a purchaser, from owner point of view, right? JMB, MC kind of view, uh, when the building is newly completed and handed over to them, right? Uh, what are the issues that we are facing today, right? Or recently for the past few years, okay? Um, I'm certainly not, not the, uh, uh, what they call uh, Sifu or whatever in town, right, as mentioned by Anthony, but I think with the number of projects that we have, uh, I think it's important that we, we communicate through the right party. We feedback to architect, which is one of the key players in constructions, so that uh, eventually the in overall industry, especially to property management and also to the uh, handling over process from developer to purchaser can eventually become a happy process, right? So usually when we took over uh, uh, what they call projects, okay? Uh, first question we will ask to developer, is this, an, is, is this uh, appointment got to include the handover or take, take over by purchaser or not, right? So I think we all get scared off with this process. But sometimes it's very often I will ask, why shall we scare off? This is a happy, happy process if everybody do it at the right, uh, what they call it, the, the quality of the products deliver at the reasonable kind of uh, 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 level. I'm sure this is the happy process. People buying, just like people buying new car, they happily go and take over a, a position. Same thing go to apartments, condo, high-end, medium-end, the kind of, uh, it's their home. Right or even commercial buildings. Right, so I think moving forward, we really hope with this sharing session, uh, certain things that we can pick up by the professions, then we can actually work together for the benefit of purchasers, which every one of us are purchasers. Okay, so um, we move to the next one. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, when we take over the uh, any assignments or any projects, they involve three main uh, components, right? Operations, that's involved M and E, C and S, structure, that kind of things. Accounts, of course, that is uh, that's where we, we come in. We will have established the management, management fund, maintenance fund, sinking fund, the kind of uh, uh, what they call setup, uh, service charges, okay, share units. And the next one is building condition. Okay, building, why do we do building conditions? Because a lot of the time, when we take over, I'm talking about new buildings. New buildings or old buildings, we will also do building conditions. Let's focus on new buildings in today's discussion. Okay, uh, we, would, we would do a building condition report to protect the purchaser as well as the developer, as well as property manager, just to protect everybody. Okay, because we know within the 12 months, of the vacant positions, we need to form JMB. Okay, that's where the owner will take ownership and they will start involved into the management and maintenance of common area. Okay, and very often nowadays, I will say for the recent past at least three to four years, the awareness of the purchasers become have reached a certain level where they have become so aware, they have a, a high awareness about the facts. So we, the report is very important that to log in. We log in the report so that uh, with the condition that we take over, we were able to generate it to feedback to developer. These are the areas that uh, should be paid attention as well as certain action need to be taken so that uh, eventually when JMB or, or MC be informed, all these defects or all these weaknesses can be then uh, rectified according, accordingly. Okay, so the QD... The building condition report, I think for us right now, is very, very important, okay? Uh, straight to the point, what are those issues? What are those issues that we face uh, when, uh, or even asked by purchaser, okay? When we start to take over buildings uh, from uh, developer, right? On behalf of the purchaser, because initial first 12 months, there won't be any uh, committee. So we actually, technically speaking, we take over on behalf of the purchaser. Or common area, okay. Uh, often uh, we were very uh, a very first question asked by purchaser: uh, Do we have dispute drawing? Do we have M and E drawing? 
Okay, do we have strata plan? Okay, all these are all these are considered very general, very common question right now. So I'm not sure. Maybe Chris can come in later on, right? From legal point of view, okay, or from practical point of view. I think these are the must hand over uh, what they call documents, so that eventually we we as property manager, all right, we will know how to manage and maintain, right, the building uh, for the next. 10, 15, 20, 30 years to come. Okay, wherever there's any problem, we will surely get to refer to SQ Growing. Okay, wherever there's any dispute or there's any major exercise that we need to do, for example, repenting, we got to refer to SQ Growing. Okay, and the next thing is the uh, approved building plan. Uh, this one, I, I noticed that uh, in the last, it's also recently, right? People tend to go to developer and ask for, can you show me your approved uh, approved building plan, right? Why? Because I noticed that maybe certain area is not done according to whatever uh, specifications. Or I noticed that because of design fault or whatever. So that one, I, we were not able to comment uh, uh, whatever in our positions. But I think this is also one of the uh, critical point that owners start to asking uh, uh, what they call uh, building approved plan, okay? And they want to see what are the content of the building approved plan. So I'm not sure. Again, I think uh, maybe the industry player can actually take this as the uh, feedback from purchaser point of view. So eventually, we will address this once and for all. Okay. Um, very common. Very often. Uh, of course, being developer, I'm sure developer will focus on unit internal defects and common area defects. Uh, maybe is secondary one. But when we come in as property manager, we will surely cover the common area defects, okay? Because just to share with everybody, uh, this, since this is a sharing session, I, uh, there's one, uh, I come across a scenario where the moment JMB is established, okay? The first, the very first day and very first meeting, the committee will ask to see to and interview us, right? Because they have this perception. Appointed property manager probably, right? will cover up certain defects on behalf of the developer. Which I think very often there's not the case. There's no instruction given to us from developer or there's no any intention as property manager for us to cover up any defect for, even for common area. Defect, I'm sure the owner will, pay, will, will put a lot of attention. But common area, I think for the benefit of purchasers, right? They are, they are buying what they're supposed to, uh, I mean, they, they're supposed to, to get what are they buying for. Okay, so I think all these things, right, we got to make sure it's all properly documented, recorded. And I'm sure maybe due to certain workmanship or due to, due to a worker's or labor's problem, some of the uh, defects might not be able to be rectified according to the schedule. But I'm sure more than 80% of our clients, which are developers in this case, the intention is there, right? They are not they are not, they are, they are not, they know there's, there's no plan to run away from defects. There's a, this, this one I can very sure. Just that maybe there are certain delay due to technical, due to labors or whatever reason. That's why I cause certain misunderstanding between the purchasers and the developer. So today is where we do not want the misunderstanding become deeper and deeper, right? And of course, uh, some party might take advantage in between this communication channel, right? And sometimes I notice that developer also they're not sort of meet up with the committee appointed, even though they are part of the JMB and JMB um, due to certain unknown reason. Maybe they say develop, to face JMB is very troublesome or whatever, but I think to us is JMB or committee or purchasers in this case, they just want to have clear communication with developer to, to uh, clarify certain things that, that they are not clear. So I think it will be good that to break the communication uh, channel, right? To have a very close communication between purchaser and developer, which we come across, even though certain defects not, be, not able to be rectified, but they end up with very harmonious kind of discussion, okay? Uh, not to say the purchaser are willing to compromise, but they are become, becoming more understanding, okay? Or this one, or this is the intention of why you build like that. Or why, why are you putting such facilities in this area? So the intention are not properly explained to the teacher most of the time. 
Of course, we will, we will try to do our job to, ex to explain to the purchaser, but it will be good. People always say, come from the horse's mouth. Okay, come from developer. I mean, the weight is definitely heavier than property manager. Okay, and uh, uh, like lacking down in follow-up defects. I think again, this one, I think whether we like it or not, in today's trend, okay, property manager will have to work together with developer to keep track all the defects. Not to say developer wanted to run away from defect, but maybe because of certain lacking of certain manpower or whatever, right? Or maybe it's and, and any reason that maybe you can enlighten me in, in, in state that we need to work together so that a proper documentations will be recorded, all right? So that all the follow-up action can be done accordingly. Right, so there won't be any misunderstanding that oh, you short shortchange me. You're giving me this material instead of that material, right? And in fact, some of the I will come across very often some of the most of the developer, okay, really like to uh, uh, what I call upgrade whatever material or whatever spec from the original one, but to purchaser because of lacking of lack of communication, they thought is developer wanted to shortchange them. So I think again, communication is is not an option. We must face the purchaser, and I'm sure, based on our experience, most of the time is ended up with harmonies and happy ending kind of uh, uh, what they call scenario. Okay, uh, quality of material use. Uh, this one again, I think ABS. I think all the industry player know is is uh, maybe I think Anthony, you can you can chip in after this. We face a lot of uh, maybe, uh, pipe bursts suddenly overnight. Sometimes at the middle of the night, new building, one, two years old. You're talking about one, two years old building. We got pipe bursts, not at the joint, but in the middle of the pipe itself. Okay, so, so and worse still, if the pipe is the, if, if the pipe is the bus is nearby, lift lobby, lift feet, fire control room, LB room, or switch room, that is a nightmare to us. It can cause the entire building. Uh, have a major tripping. Okay. M and E and plumbing design issue, especially for mixed development. Okay, again, this one, uh, mixed development has become more common right now, right? Due to density or whatever reason. So developer tend to develop mixed development. Okay. So we have residential up there, we have commercial component, and we can we even have office components. But I noticed that planning of M and E, there are a bit of lacking over in, in this aspect. Because uh, maybe it's, I am sure it's not intention. Look by looking at the problems that we have, it's not the intention of the developer to purposely mess up the the uh, what they call uh, wiring or M and E kind of design. But maybe it's the implementation stage, right? Very often that we will take over the committee or the uh, what they call the purchaser will say, hey, I suspect this one uh, this component uh, which is related related to developer, they tapping they tap off a supply from our our common area. Okay, and fortunate or unfortunate, of course, we will then do a load test. Okay, we turn off the supply, we will see which area are supported by essential one, right? And true enough, why is that a unit? We turn off the uh, what they call uh, uh, MSP supply. Why is that a unit lighting are still on and is supported by essential wiring? Why? Right, I'm sure it's not the intention. Okay, but somehow it's happening. So, and again, that's where the confidence level, the trust level start to break. Okay, they say, oh, you see, I told you already, this, this, is, this development is taking advantage of us. And then they will start to dig more and more and more and more. Right? So I think um, let's be very professional and uh, let's implement all this very systematically. Okay, and uh, some of the technical yeah, completed issue at uh, the completed buildings. Okay, we, we usually divide it into three or four categories firefighting, okay, lift system, electrical system, and others. To us, things that we cannot compromise uh, safety and security. Okay, you're talking about life threatening kind of uh, uh, what they call um, services, firefighting. Okay, even those. Of very often that a very straightforward answer given by developer is, hey, I got fireman certificates, so I'm, my system is all in compliance. But in reality, okay, in reality, whether or not 
a fire control panel, addressable system, our sprinkler system, our horse rail system, okay, our brake class system, and also jockey pump, horse rail, uh, standby pump, duty pump, all these are in order or not? There is also a question mark sometimes, but of course we will carry out the checking thoroughly. Okay, and very often when we take over a new building, the smoke detector is still covered up by a, a, what they call a plastic cover, which is not functioning at all. Okay, and these are the areas, some of the areas we might not be able to see. Some are at the end, uh, a vacant unit. Okay, so a bit of uh, example, okay, on how, what is the condition of, of, of the of, of buildings. Okay, and uh, move from the next one. Okay, uh, okay, this is very interesting. You see, I come across one development. You look at the, the left side, the leaf indicator. Inside the leaf, car leaf itself, they are both left and right side. Okay, both indicate a different floor level. I want to go to level 14. One indicate when the leaf reach level 14, one indicate at level 8, and another one indicate at level 14. Again, I think this is something that small, petty, but again, you purchaser will feel very annoying. Imagine, let's say we buy our own house or our own office, we have this problem. Number one, it's very confusing, especially we have we have old mother, right? We have a senior citizen at our home, right? It will be very confusing to them. Okay, and number two is it's very embarrassed. Okay, we want happily we do open house, happily we, we invite people for our office opening. But hey, why your leaf is like that? Why is indicate? Is this is real time, real life example, okay? And the next one is the water seepage in the lift pit, okay? And again, we need to do a manual suctions to pump up all the water. I know sometimes it's due to water tablet or whatever, but I think please put attention on all this, all right? Uh, again, you can see the photo. Why is that the car park in front of the lift lobby in this case? Okay, I don't, I, I cannot comment whether it's design or whatever. Perhaps the industry player right, can enlighten us, can enlighten me, or can enlighten the chaser on why is all these things are still happening. Okay, next one. Uh, next one. Next slide. Okay, you can see uh, one of the examples, this is uh, completed buildings. We notice that uh, depth of the drainage at the basement car park is not enough. It's then we have no choice but to widen it, okay? Lack of gradient at the rooftop, causing a seepage to a multi-million penthouses, okay? Again, I'm sure this is not due to design or whatever fault, but I'm sure this is more towards, okay, uh, implementations. Supervisor, supervisory role at site is, is very important. Okay, you look at the right side of the uh, uh, picture, uh, it's very normal, it's a very beautiful jante ceiling. But actually there's an oil air con in there. Okay. As how do we going to service the indoor air con if let's say it's blocked by all this panel and there's no accessible at all? I thought there will be an opening, there will be a flexi panel that we can open up to service, but there's none. Okay. So I'm sure I'm not sure what is the process. Perhaps it's due to design or lack of oil and that kind of things. Okay, uh, these are some of the um, common misunderstanding. Okay, uh, highlighted by purchaser owner, uh, confused between internal defect and common error defects. The moment they've spotted certain defects in their units, okay, or the moment they spotted certain defect in common area, they will then to jump, mix up everything together, and we will be eventually the bunching back for them. Okay, because. To them, for them, uh, they say, I don't care whether you are management or you are developer. As long as you are here, you are managing our premises, our building, you should be the one responsible for this. Okay, they will not care what kind of appointment we have. Inter interfloor leaking, leakage are still the main challenge. And if, I think for, the, for recent years, it, it becomes worse. Okay, interfloor leaking, right? So I think uh, full attention, a proper attention, proper methodology really need to put in place so that people can take over position happily. Okay, and uh, different expectation from GMB, MC, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, recurrent defects after rectified by developer. 
again, I'm talking about a small minority, all right, of the industry player. Uh, sometimes they just get uh, general workers to just do a simple patch up. And the purchaser or JMB MC will come, to, have come and ask us, um, Mr. Henry Butcher, is this proper methodology to rectify this defect? Okay, so because a lot of them are laymen, they say, is, it, are they, is this the right thing to do for a developer to rectify defect in such manner? And true enough, after six months, after eight months, the same thing, same defect, recurred again. So to them is again, okay, Okay, this developer is taking advantage on us. Let's go to Chris and we initiate legal actions, which is the last thing we want to do. All right. So I would say developer often have very good intention, but somehow the implementation stage, something go wrong. Okay. Um, again, communication uh, challenges between JMB, MC and property developer. So I think let's break through the communication gap and, and work together towards the better uh, benefit of everybody. Okay, so I think there are a lot more examples that uh, we would like to share. Uh, for example, there's no water fall trap in the, uh, what they call, uh, service room. In the car park, there's no water tap. Okay, so how do we going to maintain the buildings eventually? Okay, so I think I'll leave it to, uh, uh, back to you, Anthony. Um, there are a lot more to share, but I think that we really hope that communication, communication is the key things between purchaser and developer. So let's just build something together for the benefit of the, of the entire industry. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Hong Kiong. Yeah. Um, you want to mute? Yeah, thank you. All right, now before I move on to the next speaker, Chris, um, you know, I just wanted to put things in perspective about expectation management, which is what Chris was uh, talking about during edition one and edition two. You know, this is just, just an illustration to show you that during the marketing and before you sign the SMP, yeah, there's a lot of smiles and there's a lot of happiness. And obviously, that's what Hong Kiong was saying when you take your keys, you want it to be a happy occasion. You know, you're buying into a new home, you're planning to move into a new home, right? But once the defects and DLP starts, the leaks and cracks and breakdown starts to happen, the smiles become a little bit uh, difficult to, to manage. Uh, so, you know, with, with, with that, right, I, I do have a couple of questions here uh, for us to, to jump in as well. And the first question here, uh, I would like to direct this to, to Hong Kiong. So Hong Kiong, after, after, you know, what you said, it seems to me that uh, there's you know, because you are responsible for maintaining and managing this building. You have a responsibility under the Strata Management Act as the property manager to maintain properties uh, properly, you know, uh, either by, by scheduled maintenance or maintenance that you have to do because of regulations and so forth. Now, how important is accessibility for proper servicing and maintenance of building? And do you think that design plays an important factor? I think if you ask me, because we have, we have building that we manage, as old as I think 30 years old, and we have been holding the project for the last 20 years and we are still managing it. That particular project or the few projects of it, compared to newer buildings, somehow the thought of accessibility is more on old buildings rather than new buildings. Okay, mm. we find it is very easy to, to service, for example, let's say we want to carry out uh, calibration, switch room. Okay, it's so proper, the spacing are so proper that our appointed consultant or charge man can actually carry out the calibration or servicing of genset so easy. Compared to newer building, I don't know, maybe it's because of, I, I don't know, this is, I probably ask, asking a question, because of developer, developer try to squeeze in uh, everything in the smallest space due to cost or whatever, that eventually the servicing becomes so difficult for us to do. And often it become a, a what they call hazard or safety, hazard to those who are going to carry out the servicing, which is more towards our maintenance people. Okay, so I think, uh, I think design, right? Uh, another example is you can see, we also, we often carry out repainting after the building reach about 10 years old. Okay, I'm, I'm sure not many buildings, especially residential building can, can enjoy the, uh, what they call benefit where you can have gondola, ready gondola at your rooftop, maybe due to cost of practicality issue, but at least we must have the proper platform for us to hang gondola 
or even absolute method. Okay, but I noticed that it's none in, in some in I think in quite a lot of buildings. And it's also come across to us, all right? We need to access to uh, owner's unit, right? And we pay a bit of rental to them to hang all the platform. And we can't, it's lucky enough, it's kind enough for the owner to render the space for us to do, uh, to, to, to erect the platform so that they can, the contractor or painter can do uh, what they call mm. NOLA or whatever. Mm. But what if, let's say, we don't have that kind of uh, uh, high owner in the development? We have no choice but to pull up the scaffolding, right? Which will eventually, the cost will become higher because it's different method. Mm. Okay, thank you, Hong Kiong. Yeah, that, that's insightful because you know, uh, recently you know you you've won a few um, best managed property award, and I think in in those those kind of instances, what we have noticed, even in the work that we do in Architect Center, is that buildings, when we are looking into the long term maintenance, the 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 beauty of a building, the quality of a building, is beyond just looking good, but you know it has to be to be kept looking good. So that means it must be able to be maintained and you know, so this, I think this feedback is very important for us as professionals to be able to think that people like you are going to have to keep maintaining this building and so the design and the quality of it needs to, to look into these issues holistically. Okay. Yeah. So with that, I'd like to go to the next question here, Chris, just for you to weigh in. Uh, I think there was an issue where um, Hong Kong was mentioning about how things are driven into disputes when communication breaks down and, and, and when people start to lose their patience and trust between the parties who entered into this contract. And often, you know, architects and consultants and contractors are drawn in into this here. So, so the, the, the question I put forward is that what building conditions drives owners into a dispute, you know, between the property developers and can this actually be avoided or mitigated? Chris? Okay, thanks for the question and thanks for a good sharing by Mr. Lau as well. I think the question is very simple. What condition drive owner into dispute? Mr. Lau knows this answer very well. Actually, the answer is any condition, really. Because any condition that you are not used to it, uh, you, 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 is below your expectation, then those conditions will drive you into a dispute. As to, as to how, for all intent and purposes, uh, this thing can be avoided and whatnot, I think it's importantly, uh, I think the word is called education, right? And education here is not about establishing what are the quality and standard and whatnot, but education in terms of knowing what are your options and what are your choices. I, I think throughout the sharing today, I can only think of one very good metaphor. The metaphor that I want to highlight to everyone in between a property buyer as well as the developer is actually a relationship between a wife and the mother-in-law. Mm. In the sense that when you get married, when you sign the SPA, everything to be hunky-dory, you thought you were getting a brand new perfect husband, Prince Charming, right? Only for you to find out that later there are plenty of defects and conditions that you are not used to and you don't know your option. So when you don't know your option, uh, chances are you, you will do whatever you know and what you think is best. For example, is it the first thing to go to the court and dissolve the marriage? The answer is no, right? Do you know about mediation? Do you know about uh, 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 understanding more? Do you know about other options to, to make sure that that condition is properly addressed or addressed in a way? Thanks, Chris. Yep. So, you know, I, I put up this um, um, illustration here, you know, it's a bit of comic -y, but I, I think, you know, it, it puts light into a very serious situation, you know, between the mismatch of expectations and also what we, we have actually highlighted in edition one and edition two. This is actually a balancing act what the developer is marketing and branding, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's a dream, you know, it's, it's really giving you the perfect kind of a, um, a project imagine, and then you sign the SMP, which is a legal document. And then, you know, what is then constructed uh, and, and awarded to the main contractor, designed by architects and engineers, and then completed, right, could be entirely, could, could have a mismatch as far as, as what was promised, you know. And then when it's finally delivered, as far as vacant possession is concerned, it's not, you know, we, you are no longer dealing with just one, uh, one clerk of work or one main contractor. Now you're going to deal with literally hundreds and thousands of purchasers, you know, and if your property is good, fantastic. But if its property has issues in it, you're going to get a lot of sour faces. And so this is why I think that, um, you know, um, 
why this particular session we wanted to bring you know multi stakeholders to illustrate that what we put out in the market you know when when we draw a plan and we and we get the buildings done you know uh, you know maybe you know those people were promised something entirely different okay so with that chris i'm going to um, ask you to carry on to with with your with your session uh with, with, with your session here i put up your slides Okay, uh, thanks Anthony. Uh, let's make it quick in relation to this in the interest of time. I understand that uh, I probably have another five minutes to wrap this up on my side. I'm just going to go back very quickly because what, what I want to offer is from the legal point of view. Uh, and you have rightly pointed out in your rather comic-y presentation just now in relation to the balancing act between the various parties. To me, it's all about expectation management, right? Communication is the best tool to really to resolve the issue. But at the end of the day, there's a lot thing to do. So how do we stay objective in this subject of subjective? You know why? Because at the end of the day, when you talk about safety standard and liability, right? At the end of the day, it's very subjective, right? What is safe enough for you is not safe enough for me, correct? What is uh, standard to you might not be standard to me. So to me, there's only one standard. The standard is called no standard, right? And as far as liability, at the end of the day, because we have to ask ourselves, uh, because of the difference in gap and standards and what is expected of the law, uh, who's bearing the liability? So if you ask me, the person who bear the liabilities, right, at the end of the day, uh, will, will, will then be very careful on this issue, right? In the context of the professional, for example, we talk about the property manager today, we talk about in the context of the, uh, um, the architect today and all the other tradesmen and, and uh, uh, clerk of work and everything. So to me, the professional for all intents and purposes are not the person who take on the liability most of the time. Uh, go on to the next slide on the mismatch. Purposely, if you see the H there, is purposely uh, do it in that way uh, just to tell you that it's really not on the same line and not aligned, right? Professionally, like we are regulated by different standards. Property manager, property manager today are regulated profession, correct? But that standard, for example, is very different to a different standard that is expected of an architect, which is the, in the audience today, right? And the engineer have a different uh, 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 professional standard. Like I said, even authority for that matter, right? Today, we have people from Australia, we have people from Penang, uh, outside of Klang Valley for that matter. And even within Klang Valley, you have KL, you have Selangor, right? The expectation of standards is again varies. Some of them expect you to do more, some of them expect you to do less. So I'm saying to you, even that we can't even establish a very objective standard in relation to this. For example, if I'm an Australian purchaser buying a property in Penang, right? And using an uh, uh, architect in KL, that's where the mismatch starts to already happen because we are used to our environment in terms of operation, right? Uh, the operative environment and circumstances. Statutory mismatch is also one thing. You know why? Because... Um, there's no one law that governs everything. There's no such thing, right? It's a multiple facade of law. Later, I'll, I'll dissect one very important law called the a, a Straight Drainage and the um, Buildings Act. In relation to that, because the architect have a unique role uh, uh, as a submission person, right? So under there, there's actually highlighting a lot of these things. But even in that act itself, to me, I can't even know what the heck do I need to really comply to, right? Next thing, product. Because in the building, there's a lot of product that we incorporated. Right? One of the best product that we always talk in a strata building or in a big building high rise today is a leaf. For example, one leaf service provider and one leaf warranty is different from another brand of leaf. Uh, and also, it's also bided by the manufacturing of production. Which means that if it's manufacturing in some other country, maybe the, the, uh, the standard applicable will be different, right? Again, commercial mismatch. Why do I say commercial mismatch? Because when I am selling you the building, I promise you this is the perfect dream, correct? But when I engage my main con, then I'm telling you, give me a nearly perfect contract, right? And then you probably, uh, when you give to the subcon, then there's another person who are at a level that is different. In fact, the one that should be sold, the, the, the least of the expectation should at least be the buyer. And then you hopefully your main con could deliver something better, and then your subcontract will deliver something even better, right? In that sense, it cuts down the expectation to be uh, better in terms of flow. But then that's not the case. It's different. It's the other way around. 
and legitimate expectation. This is where it's important because buyer don't know they're right, right? Because they are retail, they don't, don't buy it as a professional, right? Therefore, there, there seems to be an expectation to say that hey, you guys are supposed to comply with all these professional authorities, statutory product, commercial, this kind of standards. And therefore, I'm entitled to think that you know, you're supposed to give me the best uh, products or, or, or property. Next slide. So again, you know, objective versus subjective. Look at words like this. I didn't create this word. These words are actually extracted uh, out of the uh, straight drainage and building act in one section alone, right? They're talking about the uh, as a compliance officer, you should ensure that the life and health standards, right, are being complied. So my question to you, what is life and health standard? Correct? These are two elements here, objective and subjective all at the same time. Then you say that you must comply with safety and health. Right, then you have good construction practice. My question is, good construction practice, is it the same as legally required construction practice? That's very different. Eh? It could be higher, it could be lower, right? And then at the end, it said, other than this thing, you must also ensure that this, this product or this building at the end of the day must be technically and legally fit. So my question again, eh? legally fit doesn't mean technically fit. Eh? That's also different, huh? Because it's expectation of how we meet things, right? And technically fit doesn't mean legally fit either. So I'm saying to you, it's a lot of obligation. Uh, if architect want to look at yourself as a guardian of quality, which we talk about it, it's more like a compliant auditor, right? It's, it's more acceptable. So again, let's drive deeper into quality. Next one, right? Today, we did talk a lot about common property. I think it's important because we want to ask a question, what about common property in the strata development? As rightly pointed out by uh, uh, Hong Kyung just now, Mr. Lau, because at the end of the day, nobody really care about the common property. This is like an afterthought. Everyone start with their own unit first. Then later, they start to talk about common property. And later, they'll then ask Mr. Lau, come and explain, how come the common property is like that? Right? Especially when they form the JMB one year later and then form the MC many years later. Right? So, this is a problem in the law. Next. Let me highlight thing to you. This is a mutation of, uh, of strata title property. And strata development is currently being used for a lot of mixed-use development and whatnot. I'm just highlighting to you. There are now strata unit, strata block, strata floor, and strata building, right? Vertical strata, horizontal strata, right? Land and building in a mix. Some are land. Some are building. So if you are property manager, you will ask me, are you, are you managing the land or are you managing the building? I don't know. Correct? And then next question, start up within a gated guarded community. Very simple. You have a big gate outside, inside got many other gates. Right? The one, the, the country within a country. Right? Strata within strata. Uh, this is even better. This is called limited common property. Although today we only have one case of this. In Plaza 1, Monkeara, we all know about the sub-MC thing. Right? And yet, the multiple, multiple usage also set the expectation differently. Commercial usage want more people to come. Residential usage want nobody to come. So, what do you expect in relation to the management practice and, 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 and therefore, the building quality and the defect, how do we examine it? What is wear and tear in commercial is different from a wear and tear in a residential, for example. And when you integrated the usage, which is like today, I always had a question in, in, in this MCO. I asked people, uh, while you're trying to encourage people to work from home, all right, my question is, can you really work from home? Is the land use correct? Residential or is it commercial, right? For example, these are questions that are still not addressed. Multiple of the same usage for exclusivity, right? Uh, so these are mutations that we need to know. Next slide. So what I need to know, look at all these buildings here. They have their inherent problem. I'm sure you know what this building is. And I'm sure if you visited this building, you can see that there are some challenges in building manager. I think it's particularly obvious for people like Mr. Lau. He look at it and he already know what problem he's going to face. Correct? But when you design it, when you conceptualize it, you thought it's a very integrated vertical township. Right? Next one. I'm sure you got another picture. You see all these things that you're seeing right now? We try to be very innovative. For example, we have Banda Malaysia. We have Plaza Cent uh, the, the entire KL Central Development. So my question to you, do you know that all building there 
All right, the expectation of standard is also different because some are residential, some are integrated, some are modern. Just because you are in that vicinity, does it mean that I can expect all of them are class A standard? So that is also a question, right? Next. So common property, like I said, two or more, I'm not going to delve too much into it. Next. Right? And you can see, when you say I give away common property and to give it for people to manage, so what exactly are you giving? Right? Other than your own unit and your accessory parcel that's capable of separate ownership, everything is common property. Next slide. Very quickly. Right? Again, this is where I'm going to highlight to you. Because beside the physical property, this is what Mr. Lau is trying to highlight. What kind of record are you supposed to give me? Approved plan, contracts, warranties, drawing, ownership record, those things are important, correct? And then, not just that, you're also handing over a admin office, the management office. That itself got defects, right? And problem of quality, that could be an issue. Audited account, asset and equipment, and each asset and equipment given. So therefore, if you ask me, uh, to call Mr. Lau a property manager maybe is actually an understatement. They actually manage more than just the property, right? In that sense. Next. So, so I'm ending my, my thing is that I think the key thing here is a mismatch, right? Because there's a lot of gap and people don't know what they are buying and they don't know what they're getting into. Just like getting married, you don't know what you're, you're getting yourself into. That's why the marriage vow end with this, for better or worse, which means whatever comes, you have to deal with it. All right, that's how I'm going to end. Over back to you, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, can you mute, um, Chris? Yes. Thanks. Okay. How are you going with time? I think we're quite, quite short of time. Huh? Okay. Right, I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. run you all on, on, on some of the slides here because, you know, putting it together now as you know, from where we are coming from, architects, designers, professionals who are, who are involved a lot with this range of seminars here. I put together some of these issues together to show you some of the, the challenges that we, we are facing. Okay, uh, Hong Kiong was saying, how come, how come, how come? Maybe, 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 but I think he's just being very polite. I think he knows. He just dare not offend anybody because he's here for the first time. But you know, the, the, the reality of it is that these, these are actual Kesa Banan photographs. You know, where today the kind of complexity that we are putting into the design requires a lot of materials and products that are, in fact, um, you know, that require high skill workers to do. But sadly, you know, we know that they are not, you know, uh, you know, even, even the, the, the type of methods in which we are, we are using, it's still very, very, very backward. You know, even using site mix today is very prevalent, you know. So we go to the trouble of, of specifying all those things to, to stop all this, but in reality, it happens right under our noses for the projects that we do. So, you know, in, in looking into the standards and, and, and standards that we have, I found that, in fact, I think the manufacturers have got lots of ISO standards as far as their products are concerned. But what we found was that the shortcomings in standards for workmanship and installation is, uh, there's a huge gap in Malaysia. We really don't have enough standards. So most of us then rely on saying, look to manufacturer's instruction. And in fact, many of the brands don't even have technical data sheets. So what do you do? You look into the pack. And this is ex exactly what is happening. You have to look into the pack. And you know, really, you know, do, do, do you think that this is, this is possible to be done? Just using the, the instructions and workmanship manuals at the back of the pack when the very workers that you're using are not even able to understand that, you know, which products to use or how to even understand the, the language or the technical compliance there. You know, they just do it whatever way they, they know best. Okay, so that's why they become tukang, you know, the tukang from where they came from. But with technology and with the size of tiles um, changing with different conditions, you know, we are still using uh, hand skills to do, you know, work that are quite different today. Okay, so that's where I'm saying that there's a huge mismatch of standards as much as a mismatch of, of expectations between buyers and purchasers and developers, right? There is a huge mismatch of standards between products, manufacturers, and standards of workmanship and installation. Okay, so three three main areas that I'm going to look at quickly over the next few slides will be the painting, tiling, and 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 also waterproofing. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with this one here, which is this particular clause, which is a I think a very all-encompassing clause. It's a very very far-reaching clause 
that is in the UBBL, clause 53. I don't know many of you are even aware of this clause, uh, but I've, I put it up here uh, and for you, for you to read, okay? So you can go back and, 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 and read this at your leisure. I'm sure you have a copy in your office, okay? So it deals with materials. And in this case here, what it says clearly is that whatever materials that you use in, this, in a building for whatever purpose, it must meet those purpose and those function. So, and, and if, and it, but however, if you have specified a standard specification or you're relying on a code of practice, then that material is deemed to be appropriate provided it meets its purpose and conditions for which it was supposed to be used. So, you know, so let's, let's look at this here, a, a slide that I shared before, but diving into this, looking at it through the filter, the filter of this clause. If you look into here, I have done an analysis of several projects that I was involved with, either by tender or construction. As you can see, there is even a huge disparity between something so basic as what architects do, which is brick floor screening, internal, external wall plastering, and also the backing to receive tiles. Even in this here, you can see the huge disparity between a very simple mix. So because we, we still rely on site mix, so we need to specify this thing. But the specifications vary so greatly. So what happens here? Does this mean that you know, one will be better than the other? So what we felt something very qualitative has become, a, uh, you know, has become very, very difficult to manage because you know, we, I, I think that there's so much uh, myths out there about what brick mortar mixture is supposed to be or what floor screening is supposed to be, okay? Now, this, this is an effect. When, when, is this an effect where your materials are wrong? Is this an effect where you know, you've got dampness and moisture? So is the coating fit for purpose, looking through the lens of clause 53, okay? Has this wall performed as intended? So we hear this, we are talking about liability and responsibility. Who holds this liability and responsibility as far as quality is concerned through the lens of UBBL? So this is something that I wanted to put forward to, to our listeners today, our members today. You know, I, I would like to get your feedback, okay? I'll go through some slides just similar for this. We, we see all this here during the RC frame, infill brick walls, we see cracks like this, water going in. There's probably a lift motor room behind there or somebody's house behind there. So in this case here, is this fit for purpose? Have we specified this properly? Uh, is there a problem with our material or is this just a contractor's workmanship issue? So again, like I said, finally, when push comes to the shove, when Hong Kiong comes in and takes over the property, and, and when he starts looking at this, he's asking the same question back to us. Okay, why is this happening? So through the lens again of the UBBL, I would like you all to just you know, think about the, the, the conditions here. Similarly, for parapet walls, you begin to see a lot of this kind of leakages because flat roofs above that. And, and my question here is, is, can this be repaired by repainting? So there are huge costs involved when it comes to conditions in which we as architects design and detail and specify all right, and we think that over t it will be okay. But given time, is it actually um, suitable for the weather and elements? Obviously not. Okay, so if we move up to the roof area, these are some of the kind of conditions that we've seen through the inspections that we've done in Architect Center, where through rock, flat roofs themselves have very little gradient and, and they're leaking. And you know, is it really fit for purpose? Okay, so clearly conditions like this where we have done selected the materials and we have specified certain things that go into this area are not performing as intended. Again, okay, so if we go further here, this again are where reworks when, when pools are starting to have issues in high-end properties here. We see tiles dropping out, we see leaks going down to the car park below. The entire pool has to come out. And who pays for this? Obviously, somebody has to pay for it. And, and whoever, whichever responsible party you know, need to face the music. And these are very multi-million dollar repairs. This is another multi-million dollar repair uh, in which, you know, the, the tile grouting and the, and the issues with leaks. The only way is to remove everything because they've tried all the PO foam grouting from the bottom, okay? Now, again, this is a, a very simple illustration. An electrical riser room that's, that has got rainwater downpipes coming down from that. I mean, you know, who's, who's really responsible in this case? You know, is it, are there safety issues here when that rainwater downpipe bursts the, the cover and water gets into the, um, into the um, electrical uh, cabinet there, okay? So th these are things that uh, it's even unsafe to go into a room like this. This is what Hong Kiong was saying. 
in the event it rains and the pipe is leaking, you wouldn't even know because you get, you're going to probably step onto a live, uh, you know, wet floor. Okay. Um, again, we see here um, when, when the roofs are not done properly, there's no gradient. And, and if there's issues as far as water retaining is concerned, you're going to get leaks coming down. And you get all the stalactites coming down and people start putting PU foam. You can see the pictures here. But right below it are all the electrical cabinets here. So a leak, like I said, um, maybe over a certain areas you could live with it, but leaks into this kind of rooms where you've got electrical components and, and, and big ticket items have got a far more re uh, a far reaching consequences. Okay, so looking at this here, so going back to what we discussed in addition two here, this question four was one that we didn't we could not provide an answer. Okay, about standardization of standards on on quality of buildings. Is this really the way forward? So Sophie, maybe you would like to just jump in on this. Well, um, based on the discussion before, I do agree. Uh, on the fact that ha having establishing the standardization for, for for standards or for quality is actually a bit risky because it, it's like working both ways. You know, once you start to spell it out, then you know it's it's a matter of uh, mismatch again. Um, so I would like to um, ask uh, direct this to Mr. Lau. Do you think that having these standards of quality? that you can refer to in ma managing and maintenance would help. Uh, do you think that there is, th this is a matter of urgency as a reference for uh, property maintenance point of view? Well, I think it's very important. Uh, you, you can call it standardizations. I think for me, the key things here is you got to make sure whoever is doing the job or whoever is carrying out the job, got to have a sense of responsibility to the end user, okay? to the purchaser, to the buyer, to the owner. Because eventually, no matter how, what kind of, uh, uh, how strict the law we put in, no matter how strong the uh, methodology that we put in, if there's no one really follow it through, the awareness or the sense of responsibility, right? the mindset is not there, um, I don't think it will serve any purpose. Okay, so I think it's very important that the mindset, right, the, uh, what they call the awareness of all the stakeholders um, must really be seriously changed so that we will be more responsible to our purchaser. Uh, maybe, Anthony, we can look at, you know, the various standards that we already have mm. uh, in Malaysia as compared to what we want to achieve and see whether do we already over provide or provided with standards that we even even with whatever available we cannot follow or are we now um, uh, behind in achieving or establishing various standards required mm. Maybe you want okay. to get on to that yeah thanks Hong Kiong yeah um... Okay, so now I, the, the, I, you know, I've just done a bit of uh, work here with the help of also, you know, Chisu Ting guided me a little bit here because, you know, I've not really been involved with standards very much in PAM. So this is a bit of a uh, ground zero for me. So, you know, I had to Google and do all the things from ground zero. And I do ask for more volunteers to come in to assist us because this is a huge undertaking just to find out what we have. Now, you know, the JSM website here, you know, if you look into here, we have mandatory standards. So mandatory standards are those standards that are implemented by the authorities. So far, we have 539 mandatory standards in Malaysia. And I was told by, by Architect Chi that, you know, he, he, he heard that from them that we really need something like 1,200 standards eventually for us to, to achieve a developed nation status. You know, I, I, I really don't know where they came from, but, you know, I'm sure there's, uh, I will hope to verify that at a later stage uh, in, the, in the additions to come. And also for all this here, the, if you can see, I've highlighted in green, these are the only two sections, D and M, that are relevant to us in the construction industry. So if we add the two together, there's only 114 standards, of which when I look at it, most of them are related to firefighting and fire systems. You know? So in fact, there's hardly anything that I've seen uh, as far as standards are concerned for workmanship and, and I mean, not, not in the mandatory sections, but looking into the other standards, there's very, very few standards as far as um, um, the workmanship and installations of, of, of the kind of things related to the construction industry. So um, let me just, why isn't it moving? Okay, 
So here, this one, I went to the CIDB website, you know, thinking that, look, CIDB really should be the parties to, to, um, to be promoting standards and things like that so under the APTA 520. And to date, since 1998, they have a, a, a 21 CIS standards. Okay, yeah, of these CIS standards, when you go through them, you know, some, some are, are related, but some are, you know, most of them are really not, not related specifically to the issues that I've shown to you, the challenges that we are facing in the industry today. Okay. Now, the other ones would be the specifications in JKR. I think JKR has, has, has got a bunch of specifications in here. And then, of course, you know, when I ask the industry, you know, we, uh, the paint industry has, has a code of practice, but I, you know, I still have to put the two and two together. But a large part, by, by and large, what I have noticed that most projects that I have had to face as a contractor or, or even as, a, as an architect, it is basically done by the quantity surveyors. And when I speak to quantity surveyors in the market today, and even architects, most of them are saying, look, they rely on the quantity surveyors standard specification. So if you go to QS1, QS B or C, they all have a little bit different here. So it's a bespoke contract and it's very uh, word, wordy. That means it, it's, that's why, you know, when I took the measurement, it's about two inches for a fairly small project, just to describe specifications, okay? Um, so this is basically where I think we are, but I, I hate doing this moving across the causeway, but I think the Singaporeans have done a, an amazing job as far as producing the COPs and uh, good practices notes. And I've relied on this for many, many of our recommendations that we, we propose to, to our clients in Architect Center especially the waterproofing, especially in, in, what, um, in waterproofing and detailing in, in wet areas. There's a lot of details in there, okay? So um, the HDB has also done quite a good job as far as their specifications for the building and engineering works are concerned. So I, I've chosen Singapore because uh, although there are many standards that are available in, in the world today, like BS and AS and New Zealand standards, or even China standards, China, China has now produced a lot of standards. I've, I've been going back to Singapore is because the method of construction and the materials are relatively similar. So I think it's more relevant as far as, you know, us depending on, 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 on benchmark there. Okay. So I think that, that basically ends my section of it. Um, so, so if you want to like take over on the, on the feedback session. Yeah, uh, actually, I would like to clarify from you is that based on the standards that you share, I think that's very, very useful. Um, I mean, it's good that to see what's happening in Singapore. Uh, I noticed that the documents there, uh, it says, if you can back uh, your slide, one slide back, it says that standards for specifications, whereas our CIRIM standards is actually based on performance. Mm. criteria mm. rather than you know specification as such mm. uh, similarly mm. with uh, CIDB is more on the end product uh, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a reference for construction mm. uh, maybe you would like to elaborate what's your view on that compared to Singapore documents and the documents that we have I think Singapore side went for a very practical approach uh, because I've, I've relied on, on several of the documents here the one on the right hand side for, for a number of years. In fact, we've, in Architect Center, we've purchased many of these copies. And they, 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 have, they have illustrations in there that are very practical that, you know, you could just, you know, do a cut paste and you could rely this on very, very good detailing that you could use for your, for your organizations, for your company. So I, I think, you know, these, these are very good details that, that we can rely on. Although some of the products and manufacturers may not be available here, but I think, you know, there's more than enough that you can choose from in, in Malaysia. I think in Malaysia, the, the, the issues that we do face are fairly narrow, you know, it's to do with the wet works. Uh, I think this is a question that we will be answering because Dato Azumi did present something about, you know, it's, it's the method in which we are moving, yeah. that we've been doing, we're migrating from a very hand-built, you know, uh, uh, hand-built, you know, uh, work using foreign labor, and then we're migrating now towards a more technological driven thing. You know, so uh, I think this is going to be the way that we have to go. So yeah. that the, the issues are going to be narrowed rather yeah. than, than widened. Yeah, I have, uh, have follow-up question on that too. Well, be, um, I think um, it's good that later on, while we, we will discuss a bit about the, the questions that we've received so far. But before that, uh, I would like to clarify with 
with Chris and you as well, uh, Anthony. Um, we now having uh, another issue, major issue before we, we look at the possibility of standardization, uh, the issue of mismatch. Uh, the, currently, the, the question about being converting something subjective into objective is actually very much uh, possible as presented by Chris. Uh, we look at, you know, uh, verdicts in terms of safety, uh, standards, technicality, and the legality that's quantifiable. But the major problem is that there is a mismatch between, you know, what is the vision into the design uh, design expanded to specification and, and, and so on. And Anthony raised the mismatch between what is required by the product, uh, by the product and what is actually being implemented on site. So that is more, uh, to me, it is more pertinent, more urgent issue that needs to be, uh, need to be addressed. Uh, I call it loss in translation or loss in transaction. So question to Chris is that how, how do you weigh this, uh, how do you put weightage this mismatch issue with regards to the needs as compared to the needs for a standardized a standardization on quality? And, and Anthony can add on to that. Right, right. Thanks, thanks for the question. I think essentially at the end of the day, when you talk about quality, it's always about expectation. To me, it's, it's very simple, right? I can talk about what is quality and nobody knows what is quality until you've seen them anyway. Right, we have a perception. It's very personal experience because I've experienced a quality one. Therefore, this is not unacceptable to me, and therefore, every time I experience a good quality one, right, and, and therefore my next one would have to expect to meet to match that. It got higher and higher. Or, uh, for example, uh, one thing I want to com uh, comment about Singapore and Malaysia is very simple. Singapore and Malaysia, the way we want to attach to it is very simple. If Singapore carry themselves as a developed nation, right, then obviously uh, their standard could be higher in terms of all the material, the worker, the professional standards and whatnot. Therefore, whatever standard in relation to published by the building authority just now are actually higher, right? If we, if we actually rely more on uh, uh, on-site deliverable, for example, not doing the uh, using the building system and using everyone to do brick and mortar again, then it's a different kind of thing. But uh, personally, I think I have a solution to propose. The way I look at it is very simple. Legally, I must look at it from one, one, one place. It's called, it's always a doctrine of Liza Fred, which means freedom of contract and mm -hmm. a doctrine of what we call buyer beware, caveat and talk. Right, why do I use this word? It's just to highlight. It's either we shift the burden, right? to be either home buyer protected or property user protected or are we shifting a burden to say to them is don't worry you are protected under the law we therefore will shift the burden entirely on the uh, supply side uh, on the developer side for example so that will will solve one way a problem where whether we have to decide whether we still want to protect the uh, home buyer or not. So if it is the word, if I think the key word here is this, you know, if we say home buyer, let's limit it to home buyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. if it's not home buyer, then we don't look at it. And one yeah. more thing I think is quite important in terms of the shifting of the burden is this. If we cannot come up with a standard for everything, how about coming up a standard of something? What do you mean by something? As in like the minimum, the minimum. Right? If you pass this test, quality assured objectively, for example, rather than saying that, you know, because now we have a problem, even a $100 per square feet building compared to a $3,800 per square feet building, the expectation is still the same. So that's what I'm trying to highlight. Yeah, if the we minimum, can a minimum, a minimum, minimum standard, expectation is, is uh, the same. Yeah. Just, you know, so if you give me yeah. 10 items, these 10 items is all done, comply, the rest is called frail. Yeah. Anthony, what do you think of that? Well, you know, um, you buy a bag of flour, the flour is the premium flour, you know, organic flour, you buy eggs and everything, butter, but then, you know, you got to bake the cake. So, you know, again, you know, it goes back to the fact that, you know, the, the, the workmanship and, and putting it together becomes a technical knowledge. You need to have the skills to understand what you're doing to put it together. 
So uh, I, you know, I had an interesting chat with uh, Sam. Sam is our, our lecturer, our architect lecturer in Lipa. And he was telling me, as like, and you know, he feels that he's seeing the, the direction where architects have been shying away from doing technical, real technical issues. I don't know why, you know, uh, you know, maybe you know the, the the direction has moved towards doing more of, uh, you know, the static, the aesthetic qualities of the thing. You know, we select tiles and we select things now based on on the look and the size and how we want to arrange it. But putting it together now has become uh, something of a burden to the contractor. But the things in Malaysia, contractors are working off your instruction. They are working off your specifications. You know. Yeah, they, they, you know, it's, it's not like you're doing the work in, in UK or Australia where you, the contractor has to do the work to a certain standard that you specify, a certain prescribed standard. In Malaysia, you, you wrote that through the QS. You wrote to tell them, look, lay the tiles this way, mix the, mix the uh, adhesives this way, use these adhesives. You know, so yeah. it's a very prescriptive thing. So that tells you that you are actually the master. You are the builder, the master builder. You know all of these things here. So I think this therein lies where, where we have kind of like dropped the ball as far as, you know, being able to take control of the technicalities and the intricacies of putting and making that cake, you know. Yeah, I think I agree. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, I think it's about uh, assigning respective responsibilities and liabilities into, uh, uh, into respective areas. Mm. You know, the manufacturer mm. take responsibility on mm. manufacturing and product quality, but the baker or the implementer would, would have to take some sort of uh, level of responsibility and liability as well. I think mm. this, is, this was addressed in our online session uh, mm. on self-regulation, which is very much reflected in Dr. Izumi's question. You, mm. you would like to uh, get on to that? Yeah, let's do that, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a few questions here that's coming up on the, on the chat group, so we'll get to that soon, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this one here, is the, I think Dato Izumi was, uh, was sharing that he says about compressing construction time and value engineering, you know, I think these are the kind of words that we are seeing, we've been seeing over the last maybe 15, 20 years, okay. And has this, are these the reasons that, that safety and functionalities are being compromised? You know, so I think this is where I think he, he, he's, he's trying to drive at. I, I, uh, Chris, well, what is your view on this, Chris? Okay, my, my view on this is not, uh, I think shorter construction time, cost reduction, and also increase of material price, and, and things like that are all part contributing to it. But I think the major thing about uh, 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 how safety and functionality are being compromised mm -hmm. is because uh, the market are being spoiled with a lot of frail. We are not looking at the basic, right? We are looking on the frail. So what I'm highlighting to you is that I think one of the more thing that I think is contributing to more of the quality of construction and whatnot is really the sophistication of the products. When it gets a little bit more, more sophisticated, then people try to be, you know, selling the sophistication and yet not deliver on the sophistication. Hence, safety and functionality are compromised. Yeah. yeah, I like I like that answer because that leads to the next question by mm. Dr. Izumi: the mm. sophistication of production, yeah. not just product. The sophistication of building production from yeah. design up to, uh, you know, be, uh, being placed on site. Do you want to, do you want to move on to that? Yeah, I I think this is this is where we I we have seen even as judges in in the age prop. Uh, Thing because you know this is really the you know the, the benchmark in which we are seeing the trends in the direction of properties how they are being marketed the bells and I, you know this word was used quite a bit the bells and the whistles and the, and all the bits that that go into producing the image that this is a, a branded property or something right you know I think the the focus has gone into there and and as what Chris was rightly saying so the the the, the brick and mortar part right is even squeezed because a lot of it now has gone into the into the frills okay. So, um, but in answering the first question, I, I like to focus on, on the construction technicalities here. Is that, you know, it still take nine months to make a baby. Okay, Let, let's face it, all right? And today, when, when you go out for tender, you find that the, the construction time is decided a lot, a lot of time the construction time is decided, number one, is based on when we need to open. Is it before uh, Hari Raya or is it before Chinese New Year or is it be before the school term and so forth? You know, it's just plucked out from the sky. Okay, let, let's 24 months. Oh, let's 18 months, you know, or something like that. 
So the, the, the time is, is actually a business decision. It's become like that. But it still takes nine months to make a baby. And it still takes a month to do curing. It's still, there's, you build the building out of water. You know, we bring sand, cement, and everything there, but the water still has to leave the building. It takes time. So if you rush something, you're going to get a lot more shrinkages beyond the normal tolerances that we are used to. So if you ask any repainter, they tell you, I'd rather paint a building when it is five years older than you tell me to paint a building when it's new because there's going to be so much other stuff that's going to be oozing out from the building and destroying the finishes. So, you know, so I think as far as compressing construction time, there is a limit, okay? Yeah. There is a limit. And we should not go beyond those limits because it's still, we still need to let the water leave the building. Can you quickly go to uh, next question by Dr. Izumi? I think there are one more, right? Or two more? Yeah, there's some uh, more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, you, you want to get that, um, Sophie? Um, well, this one um, is more, I, I focus on question four on the okay. uh, in-situ concrete or basically uh, moving from the works on site to towards works off site. So would there be uh, a solution uh, to improve or to guarantee better quality? Um, okay. I, I think, I, I, I think uh, it is definitely, but the question that, that entailed to here is actually when we go into component rather than just raw material to be you know done on site to go component based building products then whether is it possible to regulate or to control the quality of the components before construction so that mm -hmm. when you comes or deliver to the site it becomes like a you know almost like a guaranteed mm -hmm. uh, quality and performed uh, product that fit for purpose mm -hmm. um, I don't know, do you want to add on to that? I think that's a good uh, idea. Uh, are, we, are we doing question four or question three at the moment? I'm yeah. addressing question four. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, well, this, this, you know, I think the question four, what I have seen as far as the direction in the way the government is pushing for IBS and so forth, as far as technology driven, it is always one size fit all, you know? You know, there was time that when they wanted to do IBS and they said, oh, it has to be 75% or they pluck out from the sky and they put a number down and everybody has to chase that number. I find that um, you cannot do this kind of method. It must be driven by the industry. You must help the industry understand where the issues are and, and the industry will find its, its own level. For example, they say, oh, it has to be prefabricated off-site. But if you're doing work that is it's not logical for you to prefabricate it in a factory and send it, 500 kilometers somewhere to do a construction just because you have to meet those points. It actually makes no sense and nobody's going to buy into that. So I think it's important that as, as architects and as people who put the buildings together, it's important to understand the technology and understand the dynamics of how to put the buildings together so that you, you react to a local environment. So what you do in EPO may be different from what you do in KL or what you may be doing in different in Pengara. So I think this is, this is something that I, I find that, um, you know, the government tends to, you know, put numbers and everybody needs to chase that. Okay, I put some photographs here. Um, this, this is a project that is a terrace house project. I've intently chose a terrace house project because the high-rise buildings, you know, you, you, you have a lot more resources. This particular um, uh, terrace house project is actually in Masai in Doho. So it's like a semi-suburban area but it is built entirely out of an aluminum form of system cast in situ. So this is an, another option where you could really rely on very few labors. There's, there's hardly any plastering in here. As you can see, there's hardly any wastage as well. Okay, so this is a picture of the internal of the properties, 100% built out of concrete. It just needs a layer of skin coat and paint. So, um, and then the final product, as you can see, all it needs is a, fire, a paint. So it's, so what I'm trying to say is that um, if you were to use appropriate technology congruent with the design of the local conditions, this is probably the direction in which I believe uh, Malaysia can go into. Okay. Yeah. So are I we think, to question three. Uh, I think question three. Uh, I would. Can, can we oh, put no, question three? It? Yeah. Put, put on okay. hold. I think we can carry okay. question three in our Sorry, next Dato. episode. Sorry, Yeah. All right. We'll jump yeah. to our question. Yeah. Um. I think we should take up. 
uh, questions from the from audience. the floor. From the okay, floor, fine. Yes. You you, so you take it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's a first question here. Uh, mm. Sometimes contract document call for quality and workmanship to meet the best available in Malaysia. How do you interpret this requirement? I think uh, like is it, there, no? uh, <laughs> is it uh, Chris maybe on this the best available in Malaysia? Do we get that in the? This is more like a marketing strategy, you know. Yeah. Um, do, do we how, how what is the parameter or the where do we do, draw the line between professional duty to this commitment by the developer okay let me advise someone in relation to using this kind of standard called best available available in malaysia right i would say that you know uh, you have to understand our malaysian uh, legal system is an adversarial system whereby both sides are presenting their case and then it is for judge to really make a decision by listen to both the story and select which story he liked the most and therefore select a winner, for example. And why do I say this is because if you build in the contract with words like best available in Malaysia, at the end of the day, this is harder to judge. And therefore, it is then left behind for the to totally at the discretion of the judge and based on his background of what he know, what is best available in Malaysia. Right, and whether yeah. the submission of both cases is not really conducive. So I think this is what we call bad drafting. While they're trying to catch all, but as a lawyer, I wouldn't want to advise that because if you can put in something specific, at the end of the day, it's easier to determine the liability. So just to use the word best available in Malaysia, then I think it is uh, something very, I mean, my question to you, best available in Malaysia, to me, for example, uh, is sometimes very misleading because some of the things might not be uh, uh, available right across across the jurisdiction. For example, some professional cannot practice in Sabah and Sarawak, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. best available in Malaysia, including you can you need to hire someone who cannot practice there. So for yeah. example, it could be it could be things like that. That that would be my take. Uh, yeah. Anthony, perhaps you can add on. Uh, maybe no, I would like Anthony to answer the next question actually. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll share the slides. The next one is sharing the slides. Yeah. No, the question from the audience. There's another oh, okay. one. Uh, would would we need to go for build and sell to avoid this quality dispute? Would that be a solution? What do you think, Anthony, based on your experience on building inspections point of view? Are there any critical cases on build and sell uh, projects? As yeah, I you know I think yeah, maybe okay. as a head as a head as a as a property developer you know I think that like I said there should not be a one size fit all build and sell is a wonderful model if it is going to be um, a, a business decision if it is a is a decision by a property developer or somebody to build and sell it to you but it should not be something that should be a one size fit all you can't say look tomorrow all all SBAs are going to go away. You know, and tomorrow all will be built and sell. It's not going to work that way, you know, because you know in Malaysia we have different kinds of challenges and different kinds of demands all over the all over Malaysia. So yes, build and sell. Well, obviously, if if one one uh, can have a, a option to buy a build and sell, an option to build and sell is to buy a second hand property. You know, just buy a sub sale property. You 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 get what you you know you see what you get. Correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's not that complicated for you to, to think about why, why buy into a new property from plan when you could buy a second hand. But of course, if you like the particular area and the developer is not doing it, then you don't have a choice. It's really what the developer wants to do. There are many other build and sell uh, kind of like a question mark that's coming in. It's like the, 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 the you know, the, the DIBS schemes and things like that, that, you know, that some, some of them have always a deferred payment and things like that. It's all done as a guise of build and sell or basically trying to, to push for sales, uh, you know, due, due to certain market conditions, yeah. So, so in other words, it's, it's build yeah. and sell or the other conventional is more or less the same scenario right. about the mismatch, mismatch again, you know? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, do you want to address this? Because this question we received before the event, we should address it at least uh, from Penang. Uh, Which one? Uh, the one that you put on on screen. Ah, okay. From Al. Okay. All right. Al. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Al, for this question. He says here. Look, basically, you know, he's talking about the the mismatch of of specifications. Some most of the time, architects will rely on the 
the, the, the specifications pre prepared by the quantity surveyor. Uh, and, and also, you know, it makes description to British standards here. Normally, nothing happens until a dispute happens. So in this case here, he says, who should be responsible? You know, uh, the SO, the QS, or the main contractor? You know, I think if you look into the in, if you look into this situation, the QS actually supposed to prepare a set of specifications based on the details and uh, based on the details and what was required asked by the architect. You know, it's the architect who decides what goes into the building. You know, as far as materials, as far as the doors, as far as the tiles and, and, and roof and so forth. And the QS then should take those drawings and details and then choose the the correct. Uh, specifications if the architect not doing it and and to suit that but the point that i notice is that often the, the qs will just take a standard one that that envelopes everything even the products are not inside there you know and just photocopy it cut and paste and go through uh and and some of the times you know it's 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 different as i told you earlier in my chart the even the, the specifications for screening for wall plastering and even things like mortar and brick you know what the what the QS has specified is different. What the draw architect has it has on his drawings, and even the BQ is different from what is written inside the specifications. Mm -hmm. So you know, yeah. already I'm saying, look, when you talk about responsibility, I feel that that part of the work seems to be just a process that is nobody does yeah. the and balances. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a mismatch again. Yeah. Uh, but I would like to hear from Chris uh, on this. If there is a difference between British standards and Malaysian standards, let's say, in a dispute. From legal point of view, which one that will, that will be used? I think let's put it this way, from a legal point of view, for all intent and purposes, if it's stated in the contract, then you have to follow the contract. Simple. Right? If the contract prescribes British standard, uh, I don't know why you're going to accept it, but I don't know why you're going to prescribe it. That's another reason. But if you are the main con, if you accepted it in your tender agreement, then you have to really build towards the British uh, standard. Just to remind you, just to remind everyone, British standard could be lower than Malaysian standard. But if you prescribe that, and if I build that, right, then I got not wrong in my contract, you know. And yeah. even as a SO for that matter, when they certify this, if they are looking at only purely on contractual, they should pass it. But if it is not purely on contractual, but rather than the other UBBS, UBBL, SBDA, whatever those things coming in, for example, um, then uh, uh, whether it's British standard or not, is not the job of the mm. SO. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anthony and Mr. Lau and Chris, uh, we almost come to an end, the end to the session. Uh, we definitely got a few slides to, to share, you know. I, I just need 30 seconds towards the end. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, do you need to explain the slides? Or, oh, yeah. You no, have no. It's just, I'm just trying to promote the next talk, the episode. Yeah, okay. Can, can I do that? Yes, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, everyone, um, we are at edition number three. You know, obviously, time is very difficult to manage for a webinar. Um, so, for edition four, just to give you a heads up, because, you know, uh, Hong Kong has pointed out a lot of M&E issues. I think we've covered, up, covered quite a bit of on architecture issues. I'm going to try to cover and, and invite some engineers to come in, our inspectors to come in to speak about the shit pipes in riser ducts. These are some of the conditions that we see in high rise today. Okay. Um, and then, you know, we will be then looking into structure. As you can see, you know, we are also having some incredible, um, um, you know, uh, uh, challenges as far as building structure is concerned. So we will have also a session on structure and then i will also be talking about the pillow okay so if you guys don't want to hear want to hear about what i have to say about the pillow and the pipes and the rugs how come there is a pillow wrapped around this this pipe here please join us on the 18th of july thank you okay thank you i think the other one that we can prepare so i would like to explore this uh this idea or or, or un unravel uh, the separation between uh, on commercial responsibilities and professional responsibilities throughout the process of project delivery, right from the intention, the, the first intention to design, uh, construction, and including maintenance and the building life. I think that will be an interesting area to look at and how uh, do we uh, 
link this in into quality. What do you think, Chris? Do you think that's a good, that's possible? Oh, of course, uh, in a new normal, everything is possible, yes. <laughs> okay. okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for those viewing us on Zoom and on Facebook. And thank you, speakers, Mr. Lau. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for being here. And thank you again, Anthony. Uh, you've done a good job in curating the content. I could have done this uh, without you. And I, we look forward to edition four, uh, working together and bringing in newcomers or new perspectives into this elusive subject of quality. So um, I'm going to end here. So I'm now going to pass this to Salam, tag team, to, to show our ending slide, a thank you slide. So thank you. good evening. Yep. Thank you. 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 Bye. We'll definitely see you again, Mr. Lau. We'll invite Thanks. you again. Right. Yeah. That means I'm not in yet. Yeah. Uh, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you're, you're an anchor. <laughs> no, no, no. All right. Just joking, just joking. Okay. See right. you. Okay. Bye. 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 Over to you, Salam. <laughs>